Pimkowski, a colonel in the GRU, Soviet Military Intelligence, is led from prison to the Supreme Court of the Soviet Union. He is charged with treason and espionage, betraying Soviet military secrets to the West. This is a Moscow show trial. The audience is invited government officials, foreign diplomats, and plain citizens. The world press reports the testimony of the witnesses and the accused. Testimony prepared and rehearsed weeks in advance. Soviet newspapers deliver the official version to a waiting public. After four days, the prosecutor sums up the case against Penkovsky. As far as defendant Penkovsky is concerned, how can one find the proper measure? for the gravity and heinousness of the crimes he committed. Some crimes are too horrible to ever be expiated. There is no place on this earth for this traitor and spy who has sold out his motherland, and I request that Penkovsky be sentenced to the penalty of death. Oleg Penkovsky is born in 1919 in the tranquil countryside of southeastern Russia. The Penkovskys are middle class. His father is an engineer and former officer in the army of Tsar Nicholas II. He is killed in the civil war that follows the revolution. Penkovsky chooses to become a soldier, unaware of his father's anti-communism and of how it will come to haunt his career. During World War II, he commands an artillery regiment on the Ukrainian front. He is wounded and decorated for heroism. Penkovsky wins the friendship of General Sergei Berensov, who will become the commander of Soviet missile forces. After the war, he marries the daughter of another influential general. At the age of 30, he is a colonel, enrolled in the Military Diplomatic College, the Soviet Army's school for intelligence officers. Turkey, 1956. Allied to the West and sharing a border with the Soviet Union, Turkey is a magnet for secret agents. Here, Penkovsky's career, perfect so far, begins to go sour. Now a colonel in military intelligence, he runs a GRU spy network that gathers information about Turkish NATO bases. When the Turkish network is turned over to a senior GRU general, Penkovsky is furious. Rashly, he sends an official complaint to Moscow. Intelligence authorities are outraged at his arrogance. The GRU orders Penkovsky back to Moscow and removes him from active duty. His career is in limbo. His friend and mentor, General Varansov, gets him enrolled at the elite Dzerzhinsky Academy for a course in missile technology. The prestigious academy trains its cadets in the use and deployment of the Soviet military's most advanced missiles. Here, the bitter Penkovsky begins to think about spying. copies secret missile data into his notebooks. In 1960, the KGB uncovers his father's anti-communist history as an officer in the Tsar's army. Penkovsky knows now that his military career is finished. It is the final push over the edge into espionage. In the fall of 1960, Penkovsky is assigned to a routine job the State Committee for Science and Technology. He is responsible for looking after foreign businessmen and scientists visiting the Soviet Union. For a man planning to betray his country, it is the perfect job. December 1960, a delegation of British businessmen arrives in Moscow. Penkovsky finds himself working closely with the leader of the group. 
a sales representative named Greville Wynne. He suspects that Wynne has links to British intelligence, and he is right. Wynne invites a Soviet delegation to visit England. The State Committee for Science and Technology assigns Penkovsky to lead the group. Penkovsky is elated at the prospect of a trip to the West. He tells Wynne, I have things to tell you, so many things. April 20th, 1961, a euphoric Penkovsky arrives in London. Wynne has arranged for him to meet a team of four Western intelligence officers, two from the CIA and two from British intelligence, MI6. Penkovsky and his delegation are booked into the Mount Royal, a tourist-class hotel near Marble Arch. Penkovsky learns from Greville Wynne that his first meeting with Western intelligence is set for that evening in a secure room two floors below. At 10 o'clock, he leaves his fifth floor room, walks down two flights, and opens the door to room 360. Penkovsky appears relaxed and confident in this remarkable sequence of CIA photographs. One of the Americans says, you know, you are in good hands now. Penkovsky uses the meeting to establish his credentials and importance. He is fluent in English, but prefers to speak Russian. He talks knowledgeably for hours about Soviet secrets, technical problems in Soviet missile development, nuclear weapons in East Germany, tensions between Premier Khrushchev and the top Soviet generals. Penkovsky insists on signing an oath of allegiance pledging to work for the West inside the Soviet Union. In return, he and his family are promised political asylum in England or America if they should ever need it. That night, in London, Oleg Penkovsky at last becomes a spy for the West. The other side of a land you thought you knew. Roger Kennedy's Rediscovering America starts the 24th of November on Discovery. Moscow, May 8, 1961. On his first day back, Penkovsky begins his spying in earnest. With a special pass provided by his good friend, Chief Marshal Varensov, Penkovsky gains access to classified files in the library of the artillery command. Penkovsky jams a chair under the doorknob to prevent a surprise interruption. Using the Minox camera supplied to him by the CIA, he photographs top secret reports of Soviet missile strength. Penkovsky gives Western intelligence thousands of pages of military data from the secret files of the Defense Ministry, the Committee for State Planning, and the Committee for Nuclear Energy. His output is staggering. May 27, 1961. Penkovsky meets Greville Wynne, who is returning to Moscow. In the back seat of their car, Penkovsky slips three rolls of microfilm into Wynne's attaché case. Later at the British Embassy, Wynne passes the film to an intelligence officer who forwards it to London by diplomatic pouch. On a warm, overcast July Sunday, in this park near Svetnoy Boulevard, Oleg Penkovsky meets a new contact, Janet Chisholm. She is the wife of the intelligence chief at the British Embassy. He gives her a box of chocolates for her children, but the box does not contain chocolates. It contains seven rolls of microfilm. London. July 18, 1961. Penkovsky returns for the opening of a Soviet trade fair. He checks into the Kensington Close Hotel 
and plunges into another round of meetings with Western intelligence. In this safe house on Old Brompton Road, Pankowski talks through the summer nights, revealing the secret world of the Soviet military to his Western controllers. He tells of Khrushchev's plan to force a confrontation with the Allies in Berlin. And they discuss plans for a new series of contacts with Janet Chisholm in Moscow. The complex, enigmatic Pankowski shows an eccentric side to his personality. He hungers to be recognized by Western leaders as the world's greatest spy. To feed his ego, his controllers photograph him in the uniforms of British and American colonels. Pankowski is pleased. And there is another side to the unpredictable spy. He is eager for the good life. He is an uncontrollable shopper, spending hours in London's fashionable stores, buying gifts for family and friends, and perfume for the wife of his boss, the head of Soviet military intelligence. All this with cash provided by the CIA and MI6. And on his free nights, Tireless Penkovsky plunges into London's racy nightlife, enjoying the prostitutes and striptease shows of Soho. After the excitements of London, Moscow presents a jarring contrast. During the fall of 1961, Penkovsky has a dozen meetings with Janet Chisholm in Moscow. Usually they meet in a colorful old neighborhood called the Arbat. At first, they meet in the delicatessen of the Praha restaurant, and later in a second-hand shop where they feel free to browse. They establish eye contact, then leave separately. Minutes later, they meet again in the doorway of an apartment house on Arbat Lane. There is little conversation. Pankowski turns over his film and notes. Chisholm passes him new instructions from the West. The meetings are risky. Western intelligence urges Penkovsky to be more cautious. The KGB keeps Western diplomats in Moscow under routine periodic observation. But in January 1962, here in the office of the director of the KGB, a decision is made to launch a blanket surveillance of all Western diplomats and their families. The KGB is looking for unusual behavior patterns. At his next rendezvous, Pankowski catches sight of a suspicious car following Janet Chisholm as she arrives for the secret meeting. He realizes she is being watched. He cancels further contact, but it is already too late. The KGB has caught up with him. In Moscow, the KGB's blanket surveillance is designed to catch foreign diplomats spying. Ironically, the secret police snare one of their own, Oleg Penkovsky. In these surveillance photographs taken by hidden KGB cameras, Penkovsky is entering the apartment house on Arbat Lane for a meeting with Janet Chisholm. She arrives moments later. In less than a minute, Penkovsky leaves. Janet Chisholm follows him out and they go their separate ways. Penkovsky knows the KGB is closing in, that he is in grave danger, but he continues to turn over top secret data to the West. <laughs> 